Tag TV and Tag Radio be seen and heard by both technology users and technology producers throughout the state of Georgia and around the world. Low cost, big benefits, powerhouse online branded video and audio has arrived. Tag TV, Tag Radio, there's a lot more to know. This edition of Tech Talk is brought to you by Globalspeak.com. New media consultants, corporate video and audio communications, video and audio production and distribution, live and virtual event production. Tag TV and Tag Radio is a service of Globalspeak.com, creatively delivering powerful marketing, video, and audio solutions. Cancer. Did you know that President Nixon declared war on cancer back in 1971? Since then, the U.S. has invested over $200 billion on cancer research. Despite this substantial investment, the country has seen a 5% decrease in the cancer death rate between 1950 and 2005. In 2008, approximately 12.7 million cancers were diagnosed, and 7.6 million people died by cancer worldwide. Invasive cancer is the leading cause of death in the developed world. Greetings, everyone. It's Thursday, October 20th, 2011, and this is a special alert and invitation to all Technology Association of Georgia members and to the greater Tech Talk listening audience. I'm your guest host, Frank Baia. Ever wonder the level or depth of cancer research that happens? No, not just every day, but over decades and across generations? Today's Tech Talk is both an alert and an invitation on how you can be part of the third generational cancer prevention study. As we speak with Dr. Alpa Patel, a senior epidemiologist in the Epidemiologic Research Center at the American Cancer Society. Dr. Patel has spent the last 14 years working in the area of cancer prevention research. She serves as the principal investigator of the Cancer Prevention 3 study overseeing the establishment of the Society's newest long-term epidemiologic study of 300,000 adult U.S. men and women. The third generational cancer prevention study, what you need to know, and a special Tech Talk personal invitation to join this historic research project as we learn about CPS3, its impact on cancer control and prevention, and what it means and takes to be a study volunteer as we tech talk, or tech talk Cancer Research with American Cancer Society, Dr. Alpa Patel. Dr. Patel, welcome to Tech Talk. Thank you for having me today. Um, well, certainly a, it's kind of an unfortunate thing, but so many um, in our news and information today, we hear so much about cancer and, and uh, the impact it's having on the overall quality of life and well-being of our citizens in the United States and, of course, people around the world. Um, we're into our third study now on the cancer prevention study. Um, maybe tell some of our listening audience a little bit about this study itself and, and exactly what is the process that's going on. Yes, yeah, so the American Cancer Society, every generation launches what we call a cancer prevention study, and this is our third generation study. So the first one dates back to the 1950s. We launched the second one in the 1980s, and just a handful of years ago we, lost, we launched this third generation study. And what we do with every generation is we recruit a large number of people, healthy, everyday Americans that are between the ages of 30 and 65, and we find out about what they do, how they live, their lifestyle, their behaviors, their family history, their medical history, a wide range of different what we call exposures or risk potential risk factors for cancer. Mm. And then we follow that population for the next few decades. And we look at what in the population is associated with a higher risk or a lower risk of cancer. A great example from the very first study is that it was the first study that actually showed that link between smoking and premature death, as well as very specifically smoking and lung cancer and a variety of other cancers. So we learned quite a bit about broad-scale risk factors for cancer. So from a generational standpoint, do you go out with any um, sort of preconceived notions or, you know, like say, for example, in the sense of the first one smoking, I would think now in case of the third one, you know, it's maybe a stretch, but you think of some of the new cellular devices and conversations about some of those maybe potentially being a problem or not? 
That's exactly the kind of stuff we'd be able to look at, and that's why we have to put a new population in place every generation is because what we're exposed to, the way we live our lives, Mm -hmm. it all differs generation to generation. We know and have learned from the second cancer prevention study that obesity is actually not just related to heart disease and diabetes, but it's actually related to about a dozen different types of cancer as well. So as we're seeing this growing epidemic of individuals in the U.S. and worldwide who are overweight or obese, that'll be a focus in this next study, and we'll continue to look at newer technologies like cell phones, and we'll also look at continue to look at newer tobacco products as well. So again, when we're talking about the time cycle, I'm going to assume obviously a generation, so you're going through what period of time, 10 years? So we actually will be celebrating our 30-year anniversary of following the Cancer Prevention Study 2 population next year. And we will follow this population for at least the next 20 to 30 years. Wow, okay. And by follow people, we mean simply after you initially enroll, which you do at a variety of different community locations, you will get a mailed survey in the mail every two to three years that will just update different information that may have changed. And we'll keep in touch with you that way every few years so that we can continue to, to understand what you're doing and what you're exposed to. What a, uh, From an altruistic standpoint, what an opportunity to be able to participate to the greater good in the overall conversation. I think this kind of volunteerism is, is the easiest kind to a degree, but probably some of the most important. Uh, where I was headed with the 10-year cycle, and you're talking 20- or 30-year cycle, do you publish certain reports uh, throughout the entire process, or do you wait until the conclusion report? No, we actually will begin publishing. In fact, that, that first study that I mentioned with the smoking and lung cancer took three years of follow-up to be able to publish that first report. We've had, over the span of the last two generational studies, over 700 scientific reports. Mm. And so for this study, too, we'll actually begin the initial publications and scientific um, discovery in the study within the next couple of years. So the interplay from the volunteer standpoint would be the general population, but from the greater health community, there's a lot of participation in terms of leveraging the con- information on an ongoing basis for their yep. own tests and and studies? Exactly. So we have we have here at the American Cancer Society a team of researchers who do a, a significant amount of work, but we also engage researchers across the country in uh, using our, our research population for different types of questions. But what we'll do is we'll actually recruit, and when we say a large study, we're talking 300,000 people, mm. so a very large study. And those individuals will provide a wide breadth of information that puts us in a position to be able to understand a lot about what impacts cancer in the population. Now, you mentioned briefly what's involved in the study, uh, some of the uh, uh, ongoing um, questionnaires and some of the data that they would continue to gather. But maybe get a little bit more, as we say in the technology business, granular about that. And then tell us uh, who, who is eligible to be a volunteer. So if you are between the ages of 30 and 65 and you've never been diagnosed with cancer, you're eligible to enroll in the study and become one of our long-term study volunteers. And what we'll do at the start of the study is you'll go to a community location. That might be your local Relay for Life event. It might be a community hospital or even your own workplace that is actually hosting an enrollment. We're working with quite a few different partners to do this. And you'll go through a process where you'll complete a survey, and that's what we call our baseline survey. So you're going to answer all of that historical information about your family and medical history, for women, their reproductive history, lifestyle behaviors, those types of things. Mm. You're going to have your waist circumference measured, and you're going to give a small blood sample. It's very similar to what you do at a doctor's office. It's actually about two and a half tablespoons of blood, so not much at all. And we'll we'll accumulate all of that information when you first enroll. And then from that point on, everything that you'll do for the study will be done from the comforts of your own home through those mailed questionnaires. Now, when we talk about the greater part, 300,000 people is, you know, I guess there's a, obviously some kind of a formulation in terms of how you determine 
uh, what, what, who are members of those, or is it generated from the volunteers that come out and, and request? I mean, I guess where I was going is, as you were talking about, I was thinking just recently there's a lot going on now as far as the pink ribbons and, and the breast cancer situation. And how do you how do you avoid, say, for example, getting more of a certain demographic or less than a certain dem- demographic that might tilt the uh, the input or or does it happen at all? Is it a case where it's so broad of a spectrum of information that you're going to gather anything that's already out there anyway? So that's actually a great question. We this study population will not be representative of the underlying U.S. population. In fact, no study like this can be because if you have individuals who are highly transient, if you have individuals who um, you know you start to lose. You, you can't follow them effectively for the next two or three decades. So we do have what we call a select population. These are individuals who, for those altruistic reasons, are committing to being part of something for the greater good. And through that, though, we're able to maintain what we call very high follow-up rates. Mm. So internally, if you look at individuals who smoke compared to individuals who don't smoke, as long as you're able to follow your population in a very complete capacity, you are finding very scientifically valid results. What we can't look at is how certain populations that are not represented in this study may be affected by cancer. So we do have a very specific goal that at least 25% of the study population, we're aiming for them to be from racial ethnic minority groups, because we do know historically that there is a there is a gross underrepresentation from individuals of non-European descent. So whether it's Hispanics, Asians, African Americans, we do see that our current study populations are not very diverse. So a lot of what we know about cancer we know from studying individuals of European descent. And so we do want to make sure that this population does have adequate representation from other populations as well. We're talking about the third generational cancer prevention study. Doctor, um, what about uh, intangibles versus tangibles? I mean, you mentioned things like smoking or or obesity. What about uh, uh, stress and pressure, you know, that kind of thing? And how is that interpreted? Is it just generally devised from the data that's received that begins to build a pattern? Or do you look at, say, metropolitan areas versus rural areas? So we can we can do both of those. And um, in fact, you know, because we actually collect residential history and a lot of information about occupation and so on, we can look at those types of what we would call surrogate markers or indirect markers of of stress or different exposures. But we also actually ask specifically questions about different aspects of quality of life, physical function, emotional health, and so on, so that we're able to assess that from the surveys. And then you have different hormones. Um, you have different markers in your blood that may help give us some clues as to what your internal measure, what we call intrinsic markers, may be of stress or other aspects of your overall health. So by collecting that blood sample, by collecting that extensive history through the surveys, we're able to capture that, that assessment in a few different ways. Now, you mentioned earlier about blood samples and and even talked about gathering some data. Uh, What do you do with the data in the blood samples that you collect? So what we do with that information up front is we actually, we build what we call a repository. So when we first get that blood sample, we separate it into different parts. So it goes to a regional processing lab um, in a very, you know, standardized way, and it gets separated into different parts. And then we freeze it into a deep freeze. It's actually a liquid nitrogen vapor phase that we that's frozen into. And it's stored long term. And so then as we follow the population forward in time, um, there's some hypotheses that we know today. You may you may have there may be some very small studies that suggest that a particular marker of stress, for instance, that can be measured in the blood may be important for disease risk. So what we would do is what we call nested studies. Well, we won't test every single blood sample for every single thing. We don't want to burn up all of this very valuable resource. So we'll do nested samples. We might take 300 people exposed to one factor compared to 300 people that are matched to those 
individuals on age and race and gender, those types of things, and we'll do certain sub-analysis or work within those nested groups. So for the blood samples, it may be that we are actually capturing hormone levels of one type on a certain subgroup, and we may be looking at a, an array of protein markers on another group. We may be looking at nutrients, um, a wide variety of things. Now with technology today, you're able to actually do a genome-wide scan to look at a wide range of markers in the ballpark of millions of markers on your DNA mm -hmm. and how those things may affect cancer risk. So we're able to you know, potentially do that kind of genetics work as well to see how that affects your cancer risk. The layers and tentacles, I mean, and not only from the standpoint of the research that's against such an incredible challenge as cancer, but then you overlay that with, the, as you point out, health uh, care and technological advances. I know that um, they're talking about singularity now, we're man and machine, and talking about nanotechnologies and those kind of mm -hmm. capabilities. I guess some of this information in a way gets matched with the evolution of our capability to, in effect, um, analyze the information. Certainly the first generation of stu the first generation study didn't have that kind of quality or, or, or uh, uh, sophistication of technology to go into that data and information. Oh, definitely not. And it's actually really interesting that, you know, in the cancer prevention study, too, we did go back and collect blood samples on about 40,000 individuals. And when we started doing some of our what we call gene environment work, looking at how or an trying to answer why certain individuals that are, have the same exposure to something in their lifestyle or environment, is there something genetically predisposing them to be at a higher or lower risk? How, do you, how does what you inherit affect what you're exposed to in your lifestyle? And when we started those studies just a decade ago, we were looking at a single gene at a time, and we were looking at a single mutation on that gene at a time. And now for pennies compared to what we were paying a decade ago, you're able to do these genome-wide scans and look at you know, 2.5 million markers across the genome. So the technology dramatically dictates what you will be able to do today or tomorrow. And we're continuing to see with a lot of those, we, we call them the omics, but there's metabolomics and proteomics. So how can we look at how your body metabolizes certain uh, factors? How are the protein arrays in your body? Those technologies are still only being fine-tuned to be able to be applied to a population of this size. You know, it kind of get, it makes me think of some of the biblical uh, legends of people living to be three and five hundred years old, or something like that. In terms of when we know so much about the human condition and obviously can prevent certain actions or or incentivize certain actions, uh, only to gain not only a, a greater quality of life, but ideally a, a longer one. Um, and that's another show, probably, in terms of futurism, because I'd love to, you know, obviously being here right on the ground where the study is going on and trying to deal with the realities of the moment is one thing, but I can't not imagine that while you're doing that, you're also kind of got one foot in a completely different futuristic world of opportunities and possibilities dealing with technologies and some of the evolution of things that we're talking about. Unfortunately, as, the, as I often say, some of the better interviews end up uh, going, the time goes by so quickly, and there's so many other questions. But one of the things I really want to get, get, get across to our listening audience and to a lot of our TAG members who uh, by nature are volunteers who work a lot with their communities and get involved in a lot of a uh, spectrum of different activities and functions, that um, this is one that you can actually participate in and can volunteer. So um, before we run out of time, talk a little bit about where can a person get involved. And uh, I think uh, we've already kind of covered it, but why should they do it? So they can get involved by find, going to cancer.org slash cps3. And there you can just actually plug in your zip code and you can see all the different places where you can get involved or you can email us at cps3 at cancer.org. And why I think it's simple, I actually not only am a researcher in the study, but because I'm eligible, was the very first of the 300,000 participants that we're seeking to enroll. We've actually enrolled about 110,000 so far. Mm. But I did that in honor of my grandfather, who, when I was 14 years old, died of a very aggressive brain tumor, and he was only 62 when he died. So sometimes I think 
you wonder whether you were a child when you first had your experience with cancer or even as an adult, but you know someone that's been touched by cancer, and you feel helpless. And this this really felt empowering to be able to do something that may prevent someone's grandchild in the next generation from not having to, to experience that same loss that I did at a very young age. Cancer pre- uh, prevention study, uh, third generation. Uh, listeners, TAG members, you can volunteer. Dr. Patel, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today on Tech Talk. Thank you again for having me.